If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and reread the problem before listening on. In part A, we are asked for the value of y sub m, and we need to know that y sub m in the wave equation is simply equal to the amplitude of the wave. So if you go back and reread the problem, you would see very clearly that the amplitude of this wave is 0.12 millimeters, so this means that y sub m will equal 0.12 millimeters. And so that would be the correct answer to part A of the question. In part B of the question, we are asked to determine the value of k, which is the so-called angular wave number. So let's take a look at the equation for the angular wave number. We can see that the angular wave number k is equal to 2 pi divided by lambda, where lambda is the wavelength. If we go back and reread the information, the question does not directly give us the value of the wavelength, so we're going to need to calculate that next. And in order to calculate the wavelength, we're going to actually need to look at the speed of the wave. Now, this wave is produced on a string under tension, and the speed of such a wave is governed by the following equation. We have the square root of the tension divided by this mass per unit length value, which is given in the problem. We also know that the speed of the wave is equal to lambda times frequency. So if the speed of the wave is equal to this expression, but it's also equal to that expression, we can set those two expressions equal to one another because they both represent the speed. Now that we've done that, we can solve this expression for the wavelength lambda by dividing both sides of the equation by frequency, or alternatively, we could multiply both sides of the equation by one over the frequency, just like that, and that way the frequencies cancel out on the left-hand side. Now that we have this expression for the wavelength, we're going to take that expression and we're going to plug it in for the wavelength into our angular wave number equation. And now that we've inserted that expression for the wavelength, let's go back to the question and gather the values for frequency, tension, and then this mass per unit length. And those values are stated directly in the question. We have the mass per unit length, which we're going to have to convert into kilograms per meter. We'll do that momentarily. We have the frequency of 100 hertz, and then we have the tension of 10 newtons. Why don't we take that mass per unit length and convert that into kilograms per meter? And that's a relatively straightforward conversion. We have five grams over one centimeter. And then of course we know that one kilogram is equal to 1000 grams. And then we have 100 centimeters is equivalent to one meter. So that setup cancels out the centimeters. It also cancels out the grams. Let's pick up our calculators and process that. And when we do that, we get a value for this mass per unit length of 0.5 kilograms per meter. So now that we have that, now that we have the frequency of 100 hertz, and then we also have the tension in the string as 10 newtons, let's go back down to our equation that we developed right here and plug those values in. And when we carefully insert that into our calculator, we end up with approximately 140. Now the dimensions of the angular wave number are going to be in radians per meter. So this would be the correct answer to part B of the question. We can look next at part C, which is asking us for omega, also known as the angular frequency. And we can rather easily calculate the angular frequency because we know that frequency is equal to omega divided by 2 pi. If we multiply both sides of this equation by 2 pi, so that we can cancel those two pi's on the right hand side, we can see that omega, we'll just flip this around, omega is equal to two pi multiplied by the frequency. We know the value of the frequency is 100 hertz. And when we punch that into our calculator, we end up with 628, and then we have a unit of radians, since two pi is in radians, and then per second, because hertz is equivalent to an inverse second. So when we multiply, we get radians per second. This is the correct answer to part C. Let's look at part D to cap off this question. It says, what is the correct choice of sign in front of omega? And we'll notice that the given equation in the parentheses here for the argument of sine has a plus or a minus. And the reason for the plus or minus is because it depends on which direction the wave is traveling. Now, what you want to know for that equation is that if the wave is traveling in the rightward direction, then we're going to use a minus sign in the equation. But if it's traveling to the left, you're going to be using a plus sign. And this question, if we kind of clean things up a little bit here, did state that the wave is traveling in the negative direction of an x axis. So in other words, it's traveling to the left, and therefore we're going to choose a positive sign in front of omega. So positive would be the correct answer for part D.